As we enter into this time of worship, let's just take a second to pray. Dear God, I thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. I thank you for this time where we can come together and worship you and praise your name. And I pray that as we sing these songs, it would not just be lyrics to us, that we would mean what we sing and that everything we sing would be honoring to you. May our hearts be open and our minds be still as we enter into this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Please stand or take on whatever posture you want as we sing. Our first song is going to be Blessed Assurance, and if you guys want to follow along in the hymnal, it's going to be the blue hymnal, page 572, but the lyrics will be on the screen too. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God.
for a few of you guys. It's called God So Loved, but if you don't know the lyrics, that's okay. It's a really good song to just take the time and soak in the lyrics. is 
All right, today we are continuing along in our Fruit of the Spirit sermon series, and we're going to begin as we have by reading from Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Are we ready? Yes. Oh, oh, okay, okay. All right, here we go. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So as I was digging around online, looking at different resources this week, I came across a sermon series title that I wish I would have come up with. So it says, Nine Flavors, One Fruit. Nine Flavors, One Fruit. Isn't that good? Because remember, the fruit of the Spirit is. It doesn't say that the fruit of the Spirit are. It's the fruit of the Spirit is. So the fruit of the Spirit is nine flavors of one fruit, and that fruit is Christ-like character. So each one of the different virtues that we've been going through, you could say, is a flavor of one fruit. Isn't that cool? I wish I'd have come up with that, but I didn't. Last week, we looked at the flavor of kindness. And kindness and goodness, which are right next to each other, and we kind of talked about how confusing that might be because they kind of seem like they might be the same thing. They actually have been described by some biblical scholars as twin flavors. In other words, you can't have one without the other, right? Can you be kind and not be good? Can you be good and not be kind? I think the answer is absolutely no, right? You can't, be, you can't say that you're kind and then not be good. You can't say that you're good and then not be kind. So they're so intertwined, actually, that many biblical scholars actually use one to define the other. And we actually went through that definition last week when we talked about kindness. We said that kindness is goodness in action. Kindness is goodness in in action. But today we're not talking about kindness, we're talking about goodness. So if kindness is goodness in action, what is goodness? Well, if you look at Merriam-Webster's definition, it would say this, goodness is the quality or state of being good. That's not very helpful. I can't stand definitions like that. The quality or state of being good. This actually becomes really problematic for us because we use the word good so many ways. Kind of like how we use the word love in so many different ways. We're kind of nonchalant and a little flippant about the way we use the word good. And oftentimes we use the word good when actually we could use a different word or maybe a different phrase. Here's some examples. I might say, man, that steak was really good. 
<laughs> First of all, what might be good to me for a steak could be something totally different for you. But when I say, man, that steak was really good, what I really should say is it was cooked medium rare and had just enough salt to add just enough flavor. To me, that would make that steak good. What about this one? We might say that that crab cake sure was good. Man, those crab cakes at Jerry's, they sure are good, aren't they? Well, what I think I really want to say is that crab cake has no filling and it's full of flavor. That's what makes that crab cake good, right? I can't imagine eating that one pound crab cake. I think you'd have to share it. I'm going to try it one day, though. Or what about this? We might say the fishing today was good. Yeah, the fishing today was really good. Well, what we're probably really thinking and meaning is, I'm so glad I caught some fish today. I'm so glad I didn't come home empty-handed. Man, fishing was good today, right? Or what about, what about this one? We might say, your children are so good. Your children are really good. Well, what we might really mean is they're obedient or quiet or not annoying. They're good. Your children are really good. But I think we get the point, right? We use good in all kinds of different ways. So when Paul lists goodness as one of the nine flavors of the fruit of the Spirit, what exactly does he mean? What is he calling us to cultivate in our lives as Jesus followers? Last week, I did mention the Greek word that's used for goodness here. It's agasothune. Agasothune. Let's say that together. Agasothune. One more time. Agasothune. Now, the, the root word of agasothune is agaso. And agaso is used like over 100 times in the New Testament. But agasothune is only used, does anybody remember? This is trivia from last week. How many times I mentioned it? I have to dig back in the archives for that one. Nope. Who said that? Four. Nice job. Mark, that was really good. Really good. <laughs> what I really meant to say is yeah, that was lucky enough. Our Agasothune is only used four times in the New Testament. Even more than that, it's not used in extra biblical writings. In other words, in ancient Greek literature, the word Agasothune was never used. It's literally only used in the New Testament and then in other church writings throughout history. So it's a very important word. It, it's almost like Paul created a word for this goodness so that we wouldn't get tripped up and that's the, so that we would also know there's a difference between goodness and kindness. So here's, here's what the different lexicons and Thayer's dictionaries all say that agasothune means. It's intrinsic, we'll go back, sorry. It's intrinsic goodness. That means it's a goodness that just exists within us. It's not an external thing, it's an internal thing. It's an uprightness in heart. It's morally virtuous. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about goodness. That's the flavor that Paul is calling on us to, to be cultivated within our lives. It's a posture of the heart. But it's not passive. It's active. It actively chooses right over wrong. It is a heart that firmly and persistently resists all moral evil. It's a heart that chooses and follows all moral good. It's active. Now, there are three truths this morning that I'd like for us to take away that will help us to understand this goodness that's to be cultivated within everyone who calls on Jesus as both Savior and Lord. Truth number one, and this is the most important and foundational of all of the truths. The power for goodness comes from God. The power for goodness comes from God. It actually originates from him. Agasothune, goodness, uprightness, originates from God. The psalmists all understood this. There's multiple authors within the psalms. They all understood this because they all said it. And I'm just going to share with you a few of the examples of what they said. In Psalm 25, verse 8, it says this, Good and upright is the Lord. 
Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. Next one, Psalm 34, verse 8. This is my favorite, I think, of all these. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. I like that. Taste and see. It's like, just try him. Just try him out and see how good he is. And you will be blessed if you take refuge in him. I love it. Next one, Psalm 107, verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. That's quoted in the Psalms many, many, many times. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. He is good, why? Because his love endures forever. It does not cease. Next one. Psalm 119, verse 68. You are good, and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. You are good, and what you do is good. Next one. Last one. Psalm 145, verse 6 through 7. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness. It's limitless. It's abundant. There's no lack of goodness in God. And joyfully sing of your righteousness. God's goodness is his character. By his very nature, it is who he is. So we're going to say something together. Good is who God is. Okay? Good is who God is. One more time. Good is who God is. Good is who God is. By his very nature, it's who he is. And his goodness goes beyond any earthly description. All of those different ways that we use the word good, they don't do any justice to the goodness of God. And good is not something that he would ever cease to be because good is who God is. What would happen then if we only use the word good in light of this understanding that good is who God is? What would happen? Well, I believe we would only use good to describe two different things. First, and most obvious, God. Because good is who God is, right? Second, any place that God inhabits, we could say is good. Because if good is who God is, and God is some place, that place must be good. Amen? Amen. But that's where we run into a bit of a problem for humanity. And this is a problem that even the secular world recognizes. So as I was preparing for the message, I came across this article about a man who's he's passed away in 2022. His name is Jacob Needleman. And he was a secular philosopher and a professor of philosophy of religion, which I don't quite understand. He's a secular philosopher and also a professor of philosophy of religion. And he taught at San Francisco State University. In 2008, he wrote a book called Why Can't We Be Good? <laughs> Why Can't We Be Good? His thesis, the main idea, was this. Even though social theorists, therapists, politicians, and pretty much everybody else are working like crazy to write books about how people should live, there's just one thing that they're all forgetting. Everybody basically knows how they ought to live. We just can't do it. That's the premise of his whole book. He would go on to say that nobody's got the strength to do what we know we should. He said this is the biggest mystery and problem of the human race. He would go on to say, why are we writing all these books telling people how they ought to live? People know what they ought to do, but they just won't and can't do it. It's impossible. And people know they should not do certain things, but they do them anyway. That's our problem, Needleman says. Human beings know how they should live, but they can't, and they won't, and he has no idea why. <laughs> it took Mr. Needleman an entire book of over 300 pages, I think it's like 304 in print, 300 pages to share something with the world that God sums up for us in one verse in Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Romans 3.10 says this, As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. Other translations say, there is no one who does good, not even one. 
pretty much sums up everything Mr. M Mr. Needleman wrote in his book. The problem for humanity is that there's a chasm that separates God who is good from us because we're not good. Mr. Needleman is right in that. We are not good and we can't be. But God's word has given us the key that unlocks this mystery that seems to have befuddled Mr. Needleman. This mystery of what is it that keeps us from being good? And the key is sin. Sin is the thing that keeps us from being good. Sin is what has created this chasm that separates God who is good from humanity who is wicked. Because God is holy, he cannot and will not inhabit that which is unholy. Because, God is, because good is who God is, he will not dwell in a place that is not good. So then what does that mean for us? If goodness is to be cultivated in our lives, but we can't be good, what can we do? Well, that's kind of the point. <laughs> There's nothing we can do. There's literally nothing that we can do to be good. Thankfully, not only is God is good who God is, but good is also what God does. Let's go back, Brad, if we can, to the psalm, uh, the one that says he does good. Yes, 119. You are good, and what you do is good. So good isn't only who God is. Good is what God does. And we should be thankful that good is what God does. Because he did the only thing that could be done to make us good. Right? He made it possible for our sins, which separate us from God, to be wiped away. He made it possible for us to be a place where the presence of God and his goodness can dwell. And because he did that, and he can dwell in us, and any place that God is is a good place, then we can be good. I think a better title from Mr. Needleman's book is not this why can't we be good? I think a better title is, Why can we be good? Why can we be good? That, that answering that question would spur us right along to sharing the gospel. Why can we be good? Not because anything that I have done, but everything that he has done for me. Because God dwells in me, that is why I can be good. By the power of the cross of Christ the chasm of sin that once separated God from humanity was bridged once and for all. It's for everybody. Everybody can be good in Christ. Apart from Christ, Mr. Needleman's right. No one can be good. Actually, I should say Mr. Needleman's right in quoting the Bible, which says no one can be good apart from Christ. So not only does goodness originate from God, but it is also empowered by him. Goodness is empowered within us by God. We've already read it, Galatians 5.22, right? The fruit of the Spirit, it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit of BJ, right? It's not the fruit of Mary or Don or Mark, it's not. It's the fruit of the Spirit. That means it's the Spirit who cultivates that fruit in our lives. And the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the living God. God is living in us, which means the goodness of God is living in us, which means we can be good. When we place our faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord, we are justified. And that's just a churchy word for saying we have been made right. We have been made good by God, with God, in his sight. We've also been given the gift of his spirit to dwell within us, to do the work of making us more like Jesus, and less like the world. It's the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit alone who cultivates this virtue of goodness in our hearts. Paul echoes that sentiment in 2 Thessalonians. This is his second letter to the church in Thessalonica. Chapter 1, verse 11, he says, With this in mind, we constantly pray for you. He's talking to the church. We pray for you 
that our God may make, worth, make you worthy of his calling and that by his power, by his power, he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. I love this. By his power, he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness. Even Mr. Needleman would say, we humans desire to be good. We are just incapable of being good in light especially of our understanding of the fact that good is who God is, right? That we may desire to be good, but it's only the power of God that makes it possible for that desire to actually become a living reality for each and every one of us, that we actually can be good. And that power is manifested to us through Christ. It's only possible through faith in Christ. Point number two. The proofs of goodness are acts of kindness. This makes sense, right? If kindness is goodness in action, then the proofs of goodness are acts of kindness. I like to think, I was thinking about this this week, acts of kindness reveal the undergoing transformation of the believer's heart. Acts of kindness reveal this undergoing transformation of a believer's heart. They reveal a person empowered by the Spirit to deliberately prefer right over wrong, to persistently resist all moral evil, and to choose and follow all moral good. I heard this really neat illustration. I'm probably going to mess it up. But it's about a waiter who's carrying a big bowl of soup. I thought about actually doing something like this, but I probably would have made a mess. Carry this big bowl of soup. It's such a big, they call it a, no, see, I'm going to mess it up. It's a word that begins with a T. Does anybody know it? This fancy dish, it's a deep bowl. We'll just call it a deep bowl. All right, it's a big, deep bowl. And the waiter carries it up on his shoulder. The bowl, what is it? Yes. Soup terrain. Soup terrain. Yeah, Mimi. Soup terrain, right? So this the soup terrain, and the waiter carries it up on his shoulder. And the soup terrain is so deep, you can't see what's in it. There's only two ways that you're going to find out what's in that soup terrain. First way is an intentional bringing it down and ladling it out and putting it in your bowl. Right? We'll call that giving. That's one way. Okay? And the soup is goodness. Okay? So goodness is seen through an act of giving. The other way that you might see that soup is if the waiter is bumped into or tripped and the soup spills out. The soup of goodness spills out. That's forgiveness. Acts of kindness are either giving or forgiving. Isn't that powerful? So it's either an intentional choice, we give, or when we're provoked or wounded or hurt, we forgive. Those are acts of kindness. And those are the acts of kindness that are modeled for us throughout Scripture. And those are the proofs of a person's goodness. Think about Joseph, sold into slavery by his brothers, becomes a leader in Egypt, has every opportunity to punish his brothers. He could have even had them executed. He could have sold them into slavery. But what does he do? He forgives them. They bumped into him. They tripped him. And what came out? Goodness. Think about Christ on the cross, nonetheless. What did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Talk about somebody who was bumped and tripped and what spilled out of Christ. Goodness. Forgiveness. The perfect model. How about Stephen, the Holy Spirit-filled apostle, who even while he was being stoned to death, what did he do? Father, please forgive them. He asked for the Lord to forgive the people who were stoning him to death. Think about this for a second. There was a man standing there holding the religious leader's coats while Stephen was being stoned to death. The religious leaders took off their coats, gave them to this man to hold while they could then stone Stephen to death. Do you know who that man was? Paul, who was Saul. That right there, think about that for a minute. 
This man, Saul, who persecuted Christians to the point of death, who carried their coats so they could persecute Christians to death, was transformed by an encounter with the risen Christ. Even a man who persecuted those who believed in Jesus was able to experience the forgiveness of God. Talk about goodness. We're bumping in and tripping God all the time, and only one thing comes out, goodness. And Christ is the ultimate expression, which we talked about last week, of the goodness of God. Let's get a little more practical. Every week, it seems God shows me or reveals to me, either in ways because of myself that I'm not cultivating the fruit properly. Oh, yeah. This is hilarious. I came in this morning, and there was a box on my desk. And inside of it, it's a mug. And this mug's got like holes, like cheese. And it says, I can't even endure cheese. And what the Lord has taught me through this sermon series is, I am a great example of how not, or how fruit is not cultivated in the life of a believer. That's hilarious. But this is an act of kindness. It's very encouraging. It made me smile. But this week, the Lord gave me an example of how it looks or how one looks or responds or acts when this fruit particularly is being cultivated in their lives. So I just come out of the hospital and we went to pick up Brant from my mom and we were in the vehicle, we went to the gas station because we wanted, we were in La Plata and there's a, there's a coffee shop in La Plata that we love to go to, it's called Wee Bean. And Deanna almost forgot that we needed to go there so I had to remind her, no, we need to go there to Wee Bean, which made us pull into a specific gas station because we were running on E. So we pulled into this gas station, which is right next to Wee Bean, and I just had my surgery. Normally, I would get out and pump gas. Deanna got out to pump gas, and she got out of the vehicle, and there was a lady standing by the store, the gas station store, and they, their eyes connected, and the lady just started crying. So Deanna went over, and the first thing Deanna did is she gave the woman a hug. Never met her before. Gave the woman a hug. The woman's crying on her shoulder, and Brant's like, Dad, what's going on? I'm like, I don't know, but it's okay. Mom's got it, right? So Deanna comes back to the vehicle, and she says, this woman has been evicted from her home. She has two boys, and they have no food, and they're staying. There's a small hotel that's right across the way in the plate of that you know, she's like, we're staying there because it's the only place I can afford. And she's like, I'm just desperate because my, my boys need food and I don't have any money to give them a meal. They literally had just gotten evicted that day. So Deanna takes her inside of the gas station and there's nothing in there that the boys would like. And then Deanna's like, you know what? There's a Burger King right across the way also. And Deanna says, why don't you walk over there? I'll finish pumping gas and we'll go meet you over there and we'll, we'll buy some food for you and for your kids. So that's what we did. We met her over there and Deanna ministered to this lady, provided her with more information about the different churches in the area and the different ministries that she could connect with to go to food pantries and you know get clothes and things like that for the kids. And she was just so thankful. When they went into Burger King, she just asked that Deanna would just get the bare minimum for the kids. And Deanna, no, no. No, she got each of them a blue icy as well. So they got their big meals, and then she got each of the kids a blue icy as well, just to say, I love you, and God loves you. And that is who Deanna has always been since the very moment I met her. She has always done things like that. And it's her kindness, her acts of kindness over time, that have revealed that she is a good woman. She is a good woman. And that's what, that's what acts of kindness do. They prove goodness. Acts of kindness are proofs of goodness. I would expect nothing less from Deanna because it's who she has been. For the same reason, I would expect nothing less of God because good is who he is. And good lives in Deanna. So good is who she is. And the same is true for each and every one of us who believe in Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. Good is who we are. The last point, the purpose of goodness is to point people 
to Jesus. The purpose of goodness is to point people to Jesus. In 2 Thessalonians, the very next verse, right, in 1.11, it's, you know, Paul talking, and he said, let me go back, he says, by that, that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. He goes on to say, we pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I was doing my devotions this week. I don't even remember which passage it was, but it seems to be as I do my, it was in the daily bread. As I do my devotions, I was going through the daily bread. The passage just made me think about everything that we've been talking about. So we've now talked about six of the different nine flavors of the fruit of the spirit. And this one is goodness. And as I was thinking about it, I just couldn't help but think that while we're immersed in this series, I hope that the cultivation of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives is not seen as the end goal, just the cultivation of the fruit in our lives, that that is not the only point or the only purpose, because it's not. The cultivation of the fruit is very important. It's a necessary means to an end, and that end is to point people to Jesus, is to become effective witnesses. That's why Jesus told the disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the coming of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit would give them power, give us power to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. The cultivation of the fruit is not the end goal. It's the necessary means to becoming effective witnesses for Christ to the ends of the earth. So it makes sense that if we are good, right, if goodness is who we become, then people will certainly be pointed to Jesus who is the image of the invisible God. So we could just as easily say that good is who Jesus is. Same thing with the Spirit. Good is who the Spirit is. And the same thing with us, it starts with faith. If we believe in Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us, and by that alone we are made good because the presence of the Lord is dwelling within us. But that's not the end. That fruit, that goodness must then be cultivated. And we can participate in that simply by keeping in step with the Spirit. What does that look like? I love this verse, Philippians 4, 8. This is the Apostle Paul again. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about such things. How do we keep in step with the Spirit? Specifically when it comes to goodness, we control our inputs. We control our inputs. And then we get out of the way. We let the Holy Spirit do His thing. And then when good is who we become and who we continue to be, the people in our world and in our community, they're going to take notice. And they're going to stop wondering, like Mr. Needleman, why can't I be good? And they're probably going to start asking us, why can I be good? Why can I be good? And then we must be prepared to share the answer, which is the gospel. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again so much for the gift of this day. Lord, we thank you most of all for the gift of your son, Jesus. We thank you that through Christ you have bridged the chasm that has separated us because of our sin. Sometimes it's easy to say, Lord, but we know that that was a hard thing. And Lord, we just ask that you would continually forgive us for our sins, Lord. And God, we thank you for the opportunity to place our faith in your Son as our Savior and Lord, and that then your presence can come and dwell within us. Thank you, Lord God, for blessing us with the presence of your goodness. Help us to cultivate goodness in our lives by controlling our inputs and then getting out of your way. Surrendering to your will in our lives to be used by you to point people to Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.